So I was 11 years old, in 1956, and I see this picture on the front of the newspaper. We live in the Himalayan Mountains at 6,000 feet. And it says in the newspaper, this print was made by a Langur monkey. And people think it is the abominable snowman. It is the Yeti. Well, I knew at 11 years of age that it wasn't because we lived in the Himalaya. And I went out the back door and I knew what Langur monkeys made. And so with my father at first and then all alone, I began searching the Himalaya. What are those footprints? If I could find one myself, I could explain what the Yeti was. And I looked behind the mountains, in the ranges, over the snows, and it took me 30 years. And we had expeditions and searching. Where is the maker? Where are, in fact, the footprints? So they can figure out the maker. And it would happen that we were the first Americans to go into the kingdom of Bhutan at the time. And we would guess the king. And we stayed at the palace. So I asked the king, do you have the Yeti? Can you explain what it is? Oh, he says, and he called a person. And he says, this is a guy who is disfigured by the Yeti. Ask him what took off his face. And he says, oh, it was the middle of the night, Tom. I don't know what it was. It came at me and it tore off my face. I said, well, your majesty, what was it? And he says, I think it was the blue bear. I had never even heard that the blue bear existed. I knew the black bear existed in the mountain. What is this blue bear? So we searched and I started to make maps. And I charted where all the different Yeti sightings had been seen in the snow. And then I kept looking. Well, it happened that the king of Nepal was a personal friend because we'd been at Harvard together. And he said, well, in all of Nepal, the most likely place is in the Bahrain Valley. At the top, up here in the snow, is where those famous footprints from 1951 were seen. But down in here, I think the Yeti is actually living because it needs something to eat in the jungles. So we got permission and we went in on an expedition and we started searching and we found some magical footprints there in the snow. And what's so interesting about these footprints which are obviously a bear. We know the hind foot of a bear and the front foot of a bear. There you go. So these, then how do you make the footprint that looks like the old hominoid print, that looks like this, that I had found earlier in the snow? Well, it turns out that if you Take the hind foot of the print in the plaster of Paris, here, and the front footprint here, and you overlay them, especially when the bear is walking uphill. So the hind paw comes a little further behind the front paw. They don't perfectly overlap. You have this here as an overprint. And so how do you move the understanding of a real animal, the Himalayan black bear, that makes these footprints? How do you move that into a conservation purpose? How do we guard this precious heritage that is this? Well, the Yeti becomes, the bear becomes an icon to create a national park. And so the first of these parks is the Mahlu Barun, and it is the first park in the all of Asia that is a partnership with the people. And that takes off, it's the size of Rhode Island, where we have Everest at one end, the Barun River coming off to the east, and then the conservation thing. And then the question is, what's on the other side of Everest? Tibet was closed, Nepal was open, but with special permission, we get to come onto the northern side of the Himalaya. Everest, number one. Lhotse, number four. Mahlu, number five. Into the extraordinary Gama Valley, and we start to explore that. Everest again here. Lhotse, number four. But importantly, we start to have meetings with the government, with Hu Jintao, who was the governor of Tibet at the time. He later becomes president of China. He gets very enthusiastic because of a people's participatory approach, 
where we're going to work with the people. We're not going to police them as we do in Yellowstone with wardens. We're going to get the people to participate through their community councils. And we create a zonal management system. And so through that zonal management system, there's appropriate land use that's fitted to the area. And then we go on into the southern Tibet, into the Four Great Rivers area, where there's massive deforestation happening across an area the size of Washington, 40 million acres. And whole hillsides of 6,000 vertical feet are being clear cut. And the Chinese army is taking out 350 trucks a day. And at the same time, wildlife are being killed across Tibet. Snow leopards, and we bring in the people's participatory management approach. The antelope at that time had never had its young photographed because as soon as the animal, this is a brand new one, you can see that it's still wet from its birth. After it's 15 minutes old, it can run and follow its mother. And Tibet at that time was surging with immigrants coming in from China. So before the population started to grow, we started the Lhasa Wetlands National Park, which is twice the size of Everest, I mean, twice the size of Central Park in New York, which has now become the home and a breeding ground for the black neck crane. And with this picture, I end. And so you can see that the black neck crane is breeding, and here is the achievements now across Tibet. 13 national parks, the size of Arizona, the size of Washington State, the size of Massachusetts, and it all began with the Yeti.